I'd like to say happy Sabbath to the brethren. Um, it's a privilege and a joy to share the bread of life. Um, I always like sharing the bread of life. It's challenging to myself, sometimes nerve wracking, because when you have to share the bread of life, you have to try to lift up the saints to heavenly heights. And I really pray that the Holy Spirit will be the guide in this message. My sermons are usually very short, by the way. My sermons are usually half an hour only. I will stick to that. But if the Holy Spirit guides me to go further, I will go further. Today's message is titled, How Can I Stand Firm in a Coronavirus Crisis? And the opening text will be Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. And this will be the opening text for this study. I'll repeat it. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 19. 19. And the Holy Scripture says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. It is quite a solemn text, but we have to learn from the past so we don't make the same mistakes. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we just want to just give you thanks and honor and praise for your name. We have had some very trying times this week. We've had some victories. We've also had some failings on our journey. But the Lord, we want to thank you, Lord, that we've seen through this week. There are many, the Lord, who have not been able to last to the end of this week. Their heart has stopped beating and they've died. But we're all here, the Lord, because we all individually have our roles to play on this journey. The Lord, we may not think that we're great. We may not think that we are eloquent, the Lord, but every single one of us, Lord, has a role to play in this final hour in earth's history. So I'm praying, Lord, that as we go for this message, that you will truly touch the fruit of my lips, that you'll let the Holy Spirit control my thoughts and the thoughts of those, Lord, who are listening. So please just protect all these members of Amazon Church. And I pray, the Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be the complete dominant power in this study. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. This week, I decided to do something which I did when I first accepted Christ when I was a teenager. I decided to spend each day in the morning, in a devotion, carefully studying a chapter in the book of Mark on the life of Christ. So I went for every chapter, and what I've always loved about Christ is that he was very, very, very realistic. And his lifestyle was always about serving and helping. And as I was going through these chapters in the book of Mark, this morning I read chapter 6, I looked at how Christ had such a passion for people who are struggling. He can look on us and look at our failings, our hypocrisies, and he still wants to save us. Sometimes we look at our own lives and we think we are not worthy because we do so much foolishness with all the light that we have. But when I was looking at Christ's life, it gave me strength, but also made me question my own self. I really studied and I said, am I really following Jesus Christ or am I following a church system? Do I do what he says or do I do what an organization says? And as I was reflecting and looking, I was questioning and I was challenging myself and I was saying to myself, Christ, am I really following you? During this lockdown, I've had a number of conversations with many brethren in the church. And I said, we see all the end time events. We know that they're about to lock down things very soon. But a question was asked, am I ready? Am I ready to give up all the things I have in my house and sacrifice and even die for Christ? We know all these prophecies. We can break down the scriptures eloquently. We can arouse you through our eloquence of words. But are we ready? We were discussing how what would happen if the very jobs that we have are taken away from us? Can we cover our mortgages? Can we pay for our car insurances? And if all these things are stripped, we were discussing, can we still stand? If you look at the world, just this week alone in the UK, 7,000 jobs are going to be stripped from boots alone. In Marks and Spencer, 4,000 jobs are going to go in, in the next three months. And we're going to see a crisis is going to really hit just this country alone, the UK. 
are we ready to stand? If you look at different parts of the world, though we may complain here in the UK, in Colombia and in the Philippines, they have death squads out on the street. And if anybody is breaking the curfew, is a shoot to kill policy. Are we ready to stand? In the state of California, during the lockdown, they realized that there are people who are having parties in their houses. And the mayor of LA said, if he finds out that anybody is having a party in their house, they're gonna turn off their electricity and their water. You may or may not be familiar with Melbourne in Australia. To try to shut down or the spread of coronavirus in Melbourne, Victoria, there is an estate of 3,000 people and to stop the spread of the coronavirus, the governor in that region has not allowed people to go out or to come in. And there are 500 police around that state to see that nobody can come out and nobody can come in. And because it's so bad, people are now attacking the police. They have now brought in the army. All these things we're seeing around the world is a shadow of things to come. And we of ourselves as individuals have to ask ourselves this very serious question. We know all these last day events. We can break down prophecy, but are you willing to stand? That is a question I'm not asking just myself, but I'm asking you guys who are listening. Are you willing to sacrifice everything for Christ? Are you willing to stand when your own wives and husbands and children will eventually betray you to the state? These things may seem far-fetched in your mindset. But if you study history, uh, look specifically at our church and many Protestant churches throughout history, when you stir up the pressure, my late grandmother always used to say, it is in a crisis you will see who are Christ. Let's look at World War II. In World War II, with the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, you may or may not know, that every single Protestant church, including the Seventh Adventist Church, gave their complete and homage and allegiance to Adolf Hitler. And those who did not conform to the official line of the church were marginalized and disfellowshipped. When a crisis hits, you will see who you really are and who your brethren really are. Let's go a bit closer home. 1994. There was something called the Rwanda War in Africa, where two tribes were hostile to each other. There were the Hutu, who was 85% of the population. And there was the Tutsi, who were around 25% of the population. And because of the influence of colonialism, these two tribes were at one time lived peacefully side by side, now turned into enemies. When I done a research, it was discovered that Catholic nuns and priests were leading out in the massacres. But when they had men in the International Tribunal Court, they discovered that Seventh-day Adventist pastors were also leading out in the massacres from their own members who were of a different tribe. And we're seeing that when a crisis hits, you see who you really are. So how do we stand in this crisis? I'm not sharing these things with you guys to batter the church or humiliate the church. I'm giving you a reality check. Because when he comes, you will see that your own church will side against the government, against you. I'll give one more example. In the early 1990s, there was something that really hit the world. And I've studied media for years, and I've studied how the media can manipulate how you look at the world. They can manipulate how you perceive the world, even in our very churches today. Because I studied media for years, I am studying that racism is being deliberately provoked by the media. But what's very sad, even though it's being provoked, I'm seeing church members being sucked into the racial issues rather than approaching it with the mind of Christ. And I'm seeing how the media can manipulate how you approach world issues. So in the 1990s, <clears throat> 
there was a very charismatic preacher. This man could quote the New Testament by the age of 15 years old. He was born by the name of Vernon Howell, but he changed his name to David Koresh. And he became a part of a group called the Branch Davidian Seventh-day Adventists. Now, he went around different parts of the world, and because he was so eloquent in the Bible, people were sucked into his Bible knowledge. Now, the government, if they wanted to, could have arrested him. He used to go jogging every single morning around Waco, Texas. They could have caught him, but they wanted a showdown. So they got the paramilitary. And for those who've done some thorough research, though I do not agree with the teachings of the Branch Davidians, though I don't agree with hiding in some compound, I also don't agree that even if I believe in the worship of Satan, that still does not give anybody the license to murder me. And recent evidence has come out that it was the FBI who murdered those individuals. But the FBI was also working and collaborating according to Time and Music magazine with the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church during the Waco scenario. And if the government can work with our churches to smear other people, you are seeing a shadow of things to come. Now, why am I sharing these things? Because we have to know what it means to stand on our own in these end times. Because when the heat starts to come upon us, when they start doing what they're doing in California, when they start turning off your water and electricity, when they start having death squads, when they have drones to monitor our movements in the state of New York, <clears throat> anybody outside of that state who drives into New York has to be quarantined. And if they do not comply, they'll be fined 10,000 pounds. And if they don't pay that, they're going to jail. All these things are very interesting. We see these things taking place in the world, but are we ready? The children of Israel had all these miracles from God. He showed them so much thing that he is the living God. But with all these miracles and with everything God did for them, the majority of them did not enter in to Canaan. Are we going to repeat the same thing? With all the light that God has given to us, with everything that he shared with us, can we make it into Canaan? I want to challenge you guys. A number of years ago, this document came out by the FBI on the Homeland Security. And it reads, right-wing extremism, current economic and political climate feeling resurgence in radicalization and recruitment. Now what happened is around 2008, there were a lot of right-wing militia groups in America who were rising up. So the US government says we have to monitor these groups. But when you look at page four, <clears throat> page four of this document from the Homeland Security and the FBI, it says who the government is keeping a close eye on. Listen to what it says. Now it looks like it's just dealing with right-wing militia groups in America. But they said who they are keeping an eye on. It says, anti-government conspiracy theories and end times prophecies could motivate extremist individuals. The FBI says that people who are studying end times prophecies can lead to extremists, or today we're gonna call us terrorists. Now, when I read this thing, I was really excited because I've been telling people for years, <clears throat> money and the government is not power, the gospel is power. And I realized that when you stand for the truth, the government gets scared. I've uploaded many videos online dealing with last day events. And one of the first videos that YouTube took down from my videos was dealing with end time events, how to prepare for the end. It was, I think it was called the New World Order Part Two. And I was dealing with how the US government is doing everything in their power to control every region in America. And because it was so strong, <clears throat> YouTube took it down. Now I wasn't upset, I was quite excited because I realized that as I'm gonna say it again, money and the government are not power, the Vatican is not power, the United States is not power, Gospel is the power. And when you stand for this truth, demons fear, governments fear. When you stand on the foundation of Christ, you stand in these, in these very trying times.
how are we going to be able to stand? Go to the book of Luke, chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 is a very powerful chapter. And Christ gives in detail the only method we can use to stand in this coronavirus. Because we see around the world, no matter where you go in the world, they have drones to monitor people in India, in Spain. Drones are going everywhere to monitor people's movements. They're going to have this world on complete lockdown. Now, I'm sharing these things with you, not to frighten you, but to show you that you're going to have to make a stand. So how can you make a stand when we can see that even our own families and our own churches can turn against us? Well, Christ here gives us a method and a formula in order to stand. Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. And Christ gives us a very powerful method on how we can stand. Luke chapter 21, verses 34 to 36. Listen to the words of Christ. He said, he says, and take heed to yourselves. In other words, always be aware of what's going on. Lest, he says, in case at any time, your hearts or your mind be overcharged or carried away with surfeiting and drunkenness, and this is something which is very important, which is something which many of us get carried away with, the cares of this life. Because sometimes the cares of this life, the bills, the stress, it can sometimes take our, our mind away from Christ. And Christ says, and so that, that they come upon you unawares. So he says, look, if you don't want to get caught off guard before I return, this is what you do. In verse 35, when Christ is describing the second coming and the condition of the earth, he said, for as a snare, shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So the entire planet is not going to be prepared for the second coming of Christ. But how do we prepare? Christ says in verse 36, how we can prepare, especially when a mark of the beast is coming and the coronavirus lockdown is leading to that. Christ says in verse 36, he said, watch ye therefore. In other words, as God's people, we should always be aware of what's going on. We don't get drawn into it because sometimes we can spend hours going on about the Pope, hours going on about Donald Trump, and we forget Christ. So we identify these individuals and the roles they play on the prophetic map, but we don't get drawn into them because remember, they are still mortals. So the Bible says, watch ye therefore, and here's the key for our Christian experience. This is where a lot of us fail miserably. Christ said, and pray always. You see, the warfare is not won through debates and arguing people online. The warfare is one when you're on your knees in prayer. That is where the real warfare is taking place. When you're in prayer on your knees, that is when heaven now is now communing with you. And that is where the warfare is one. That is when you get extra, extra, extra strength. Because you know this is where the warfare is fought. It is not fought by arguing with people, debating with people, and thinking that your Bible knowledge or your church or your institution is better than somebody else. No. Christ said the warfare is one on your knees. That's where the warfare takes place, in prayer. And that's why Christ said you have to pray always. Now, why did he say pray always? He tells us why. That ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So Christ here has given us a formula. He says, don't be debating. Don't be arguing people. If you see the church is doing foolishness, if the conference is trying to ban people, one of my friends this week, he's from the North Conference, he and his friends do a witnessing every single week. <clears throat> every single week, they're out in Birmingham and they're witnessing. The North England Conference has told them that they cannot do witnessing anymore because it's going to provoke things. And I told them, continue witnessing because you have to serve God and not the institution. You do serve the institution, but if the institution is telling you that you must do something contrary to the word of God, you're gonna to have to now choose, am I gonna follow God or am I gonna follow man? So at the moment, the North England Conference is pressuring people not to go out into the streets and witness. And these things are very important for us to understand that, as I'm gonna say again, your own church is gonna pressure you to not spread the gospel. And you're gonna to have to choose whether you're gonna follow Acts chapter five and verse 29, which says we ought to obey God rather than men, or 
I think it's in John chapter 12 and verse 43, where it says, for they love the praise of men more than the word of God. Some people just love men praising them. But when you do the word of God, you have to be prepared that you're going to have to be able to stand. So during this lockdown, it is a very interesting time period. What is very sad is that so much people are losing their jobs. <clears throat> Even this week, they were going to evict thousands of people throughout the UK for not paying their bills. And through some strange reason, Boris Johnson, who people call Bojo, he said, all right, in one month, we're going to extend it so people can at least have a roof over their head. Now, I'm sharing these things with you, brothers and sisters, because when the pressure hits, we're going to see who we really are. Now, how do we really stand in this intense pressure? I'll give you another text in the book of Luke. I might, I might have shared it to you guys already, but I'm going to give it to you guys again. Luke chapter 6 is a very powerful text. And it's another text, how we'll be able to stand through this crisis. And I'm going to give another text in a while. Luke chapter 6, verses 47 and 48. If you study the Second World War, I'll be, I'm, going, I'm going to be touching this in my video. One thing the US government tried to do is try to model the United States after fascist Italy. It is something called fascism. And fascism is corporate control over a society. This is when a number of corporations can control the entire nation. And since the lockdown, we are now seeing that five companies, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, and I keep forgetting the fifth one, they now have a complete monopoly over the world. And if you look around the world, small businesses are crumbling where these five monopolies are having complete control and power over the world. And with this power, and they also work with the government to control our movements, we're seeing that everything's being put in place and we have to make this decision. Are we willing to stay firm and stand on the winning side? So Luke chapter six, verses 47 and 48, Christ says, well, this is how you'll be able to stand. You're not only gonna be praying, but you also have to have a foundation which is rooted in Christ not rooted in institution, not rooted in mommy and daddy or wife and children, but rooted in the word. So Luke chapter six, verses 47 and 48, Christ said, whosoever is me, number one, and heareth my sayings, number two, and this is where we all struggle with and do of them. See, we like to hear the word of God, but do we do it? Yesterday, I left my house from 12 o'clock and I came back at five o'clock. Every Friday, I drove off my, uh, my mother's cousin. I drove off his food for him to eat. And although I say that I believe in the second coming of Christ, there wasn't one person I shared with about the second coming of Christ. And I felt a bit uncomfortable because I claim that I want Christ to return. But do I really want Christ to return? Am I using my money in my bank account to help the poor? Am I using my money in my bank account to spread the gospel? Do I really believe in the second coming of Christ through my behavior, through my actions, through my attitudes, how I talk about people? Do I still walk around with grudges? If somebody has hurt me or attacked me online, do I still love that person with a love which Christ wants me to love with them? The only way I'll be able to have that mindset and the only way I'll be bold enough to share the gospel is if I follow this principle. So Christ says in verse 47, whosoever comes to me and heareth my sins and doeth them, I will show to whom he is like. Verse 48 says, he is like a man which built a house, and this is what it says, and digged deep and laid the foundation on a rock. When our foundation is on a rock, which is Christ Jesus, the foundation is in me and me only. What will be the effects? He said, and when the, the stream beat vehemently or violently upon that house. But listen to what Jesus says. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. And could shake it. When your foundation is on the rock, nothing can shake you. When you are so rooted in Christ, when people are cursing you, when you are blaspheming Jesus in your face, when your own friends in your own church environment 
or calling you extreme because you want to serve Jesus sincerely. Because your foundation is so rooted in him, Christ says, it, you cannot be shaken. Why? Because you are founded upon a rock. That is the only thing that is going to help us to stand in this crisis. Our foundation has to be so rooted in Christ that when everybody you love so against you, you will be able to stand. And we have to have that relationship now. You know, I was yesterday when I was walking throughout central London, I was thinking to myself, why don't I tell these people about the second coming of Christ? Why? I spent a whole day and had opportunities to talk to people about the second coming. And I said nothing. And I had to analyze myself. Christ, do I really want you to return that vehemently, that urgently? If I do, why am I not sharing with these people about your second coming? And it made me analyze myself and I had to fix up. And I said, the next time I go out, Christ, please, if there's an opportunity, give me the boldness. Because we have no idea <clears throat> what people are going through. People out there at the moment are struggling. They don't know when, if they're going to lose their job. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, they need to hear some comfort. And sometimes we should take an opportunity to say, God, and be honest with God. Say, God, sometimes I'm ashamed of the gospel. I'm, sometimes I'm scared to be laughed at. But give me the boldness and the confidence to share this last message with a world which knows something's not quite right. They know something's not quite right. But somebody needs to tell them where it's going. And we have to pray to God that he can give us the boldness to go out into this world and tell them, look, there's a God in heaven, despite whether you are homosexual, despite whether you are a racist, there's a God in heaven who still wants to change your soul and give you a chance. And we have to be able to give that boldness, that loud cry to a dying world, which is hungry. The world, they're hungry. They know something's not right. They can sense it. They can feel it. But we have to be able to give them the answer. And also, give them hope, to show them that there's a God in heaven who has every single one of our interests at heart. He said that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want to leave you guys with a very powerful text. It is the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. And this text I'm leaving, guys, just to give you some hope and to show you guys that, listen, even in this lockdown, I want to just say this to you, God is in complete control. Not the NSA, not Amazon, not Facebook. God is in control. And he is allowing these things to happen so that every single one of us can get our lives right with him. You see, he's given us a chance. And when these things are taking place, we should be at our home reflecting. Am I really going to make it? Or am I I'm, I'm, like the children of Israel? Please, brothers and sisters, it is a waste of time for you to come to church, giving offering, having debates, moaning and crying, giving testimonies, and then eventually you're going to be lost. That doesn't make sense. We have to be on the winning side. I know, brothers and sisters, that is, is very challenging in this climate. I know to be a follower of Christ is not no joke. To love your enemies when someone spits in your face and to love them, that is not no joke. But we have to get to the stage where we have to have complete dependence upon Christ. Because if not, we will not be able to stand in the end. We will not be able to do it. So we have to develop our relationship with Christ now because if you think a Christ is going to hit, then all of a sudden you're going to change. It doesn't work like that. So I want to give you guys this text of encouragement, the second King chapter six. Now the king of Syria, you know, Syria back in the day was like a really strong power. Today, unfortunately, Syria is messed up. You know, when you read the book of Acts and it talks about the apostle Paul's Damascus Road experience. Look at Damascus now. Damascus now in Syria is one of the worst places to live in in the entire world because of the war. But back in the day, Syria was a very powerful empire. And the king of Assyria was about to invade the kingdom of Israel. But guess what? God gave Elisha the war and military secrets of the king of Syria. And the king of Syria found out. How did this guy know that? So the king of Assyria was about to send an army to mash up Elisha. And I always tell people, don't mess around with God's people because there are repercussions. Christ says in the book of Zechariah, whoever messes with me, messes with the apple of my eye. If you mess with my people, that is not a joke. I'm going to play around with you. Don't play around with my people. So the king of Assyria fought. He 
he can mess around. But Elisha, what I love about Elisha, besides the prophet Daniel, he's probably the most chilled and laid back prophets in the Bible. He was just so chilled. This is what he says. His servant came to him, his servant was panicking. Now listen to what it says. Second Kings chapter 6 and verse 15 to 18. It says, and when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed or surrounded the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, alas, my master, how shall we do? He was scared a massive army was coming. Elisha, in his very laid back and chilled composure, said in verse 16, and he answered, fear not. For they that be with us are more than they that be with them. I pray that you read this text and you meditate it now and before you go to bed. I'm going to read it again. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. God's army is an army you can't play around with. And verse 17 says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. So Elisha was saying to God, look, give him a little access into the supernatural world so he can really see who is really running the show. And it says, And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. If you guys want to know what these chariots are in your own time, go to Psalm 68 and verse 17. And it tells you what these chariots are. So the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. So that's what these chariots were. So, and when they came down, verse 18 says unto him, Elisha prayed and the Lord said, smite this people, I pray thee with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. So we're seeing here that a massive army was surrounding the city. <coughs> And it looked like the enemy was going to control and take over God's people. But we have to have the faith like Elisha, which says, listen, fear not. For they that with us are way more than the armies of this world. You see, the only way we're going to stand in this coronavirus lockdown is by constantly encouraging each other daily. I want to end in this last text in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13. Every opportunity we should get, we should not be sitting down moaning about the failings of the church. We should be looking at what are we doing for God's kingdom. You see, sitting down and looking at the failings of other people is very easy. But when we look at the man in the mirror and see, well, what am I doing for Christ every day? It becomes very difficult. You see, I can sit down and I can moan about the the conference is not doing this and they're messing around with the tithe money they're putting in the stock market and arms and cocaine. We can go on about the failings of the church, but it is better to look at the goodness of God because when you look at Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, you will not be discouraged. You will see the failings of man and you will say, God, I want to pray for every single one of these pastors in the church so that they can come in line with your word. So Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, but exhort one another. How often? It says daily. So every opportunity when we get on the phone or on WhatsApp, we should not be gossiping about the members. The Bible says we should be encouraging each other every single day. Why did it's call today? Now, why did God say that? Lest any of you be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. Because you know what? We can go to prophetic seminars. We can go to GYCs and ASIs and camp meeting and be encouraged. But sometimes it's easy to get distracted. You see, we live in a world now where there's so much distractions. So the Bible says we have to encourage each other lest any of us <clears throat> be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Every opportunity we should get. We do watch what's going on in the world, but we don't go on about what's going on in the world because once you always go on about Satan and Satan and Satan, you're going to make God's power look weak. When you show that God is in control, you make God's power look supreme. So I encourage you during this coronavirus lockdown, that we observe what's going on in the world, but understand that there's a place for you in eternity and we should always encourage each other during these crises so that we will be able to not be the hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So I really encourage you, brothers and sisters, I know you're struggling. 
I know some are literally just holding on to the hem of Christ's garment. I know some of you are very discouraged and disillusioned with what you see in the church. But please, take every opportunity to not look at the failings of man, but to look at the beauty of God. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, we must look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We don't look to nobody else but to him. He has a desire, brothers and sisters, that every single one of you will be eternity forever. Please don't let no man take your crown. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, we know the Lord that this lockdown has really tested to see who people really are. But dear Lord, for your divine providence, you have allowed it to take place. Okay, dear Lord, it's not nice when people lose their jobs and when families go into divorce through a recession, it's not nice. When families are divided and friends are being discouraged through failings in their exams. But dear Lord, we just want to look to you at this time, the Lord, so that we can depend upon you and not look at the failings of other human beings. We see the powers that be, Lord, are doing everything in their power to shut the whole world down. But the Lord, you've still given us time to change our lives so that we can be like you. And I'm praying, the Lord, that every single one of us who are on this Zoom meeting, the Lord, that not one of us will be lost. The Lord, you know the different struggles and the battles they're going through, the Lord. You know the strongholds, the Lord, which are just trying to hold them back from drawing closer to you. I pray that myself and all the brethren, the Lord, who are listening to this message, will, by faith, surrender to you daily. So please just keep Amish and the Lord. You know the different problems they may have with inside of their own community. But I pray, the Lord, that they will put aside any differences, any problems they have, so that they can be an effective witness for the community around them. So just please just protect us all, the Lord, and just help us, Lord, to continue in this journey to eternity. In Jesus' holy name, I pray and ask for these things. Amen.